I've got two soldiers. Um, the first one is Frank Hartley. Um, and we've got a photograph of him, which after an appeal came from up north, Newcastle Way, um, where his family's sister's family live up in Newcastle. Frank was born on 14th of August, 1893, at Mount Pleasant in the Healy area of Shannon. He was the eldest and only son of Willis and Nellie, and he had a sister, Nellie, who was two years older than him. She became a telephone operator with the National Telephone Company. Willis, his dad, was brought up on Roebuck Road, which is just off Cotton's side. Um, at the time of the 19... Uh, 1901 census, the family were living at 78 Brighton Terrace, or Crooks. This is a stone built mid terrace. I don't know whether they get the passage, I think they probably do, so it's perhaps a bit larger there. Um, his father was a silver fluter and a silversmith and worked for himself and employed other men. And it seems that the, both Frank and Nellie helped the father in his business. The silverware was filled with pitch which sounds a bit scary, which partially solidified on cooling and provided enough support while the silver was decorated by a technique called chasing and repulsa work. And it used hammers and punches to do this. When it was finished, it was reheated and the liquid pitch was poured out prior to cleaning. And it says that, and the family say that Nelly and presumably Frank carried these bowls of hot pitch to fill these vessels. But unfortunately, later, the Americans developed a machine which replaced the hat decorations, and this has serious implications for Willis's livelihood. Um, the grandfather, Jonathan Hartley, was also in the silver trade as a German silver buffer. The maternal grandfather, Benjamin Petfield, was a master plumber who was born in Hull, and his wife was from Philippines. By 1911, the family had moved to 35 Aldred Road, which is quite a substantial stone-built, semi-detached property, and it's from this address that Frank volunteered and enlisted. It seems that the family often holidayed in St. Anne, in Lytham St. Anne's, and they went by horse and trap, which took them two days. So I, I think it was quite a short holiday, because probably be two days coming back, <laughs> <isn't> <laughs> The family of Rankins had probably worshipped at St. Thomas's, um, and Frank was presented with a book from Sunday school. In 1912, St. Thomas's had built a daughter church, which was St. Timothy's, on Slim Street. Um, this is about 50 yards away from where they lived. And it's there that Frank's mentioned on the memorial board. The minister of St. Tim's. Reverend George F. Eakins, um, both his sons were lost in the war as well. Frank was working as an auctioneer's clerk at the time of his recruitment. He was single and had no children. He enlisted on the 19th of December 1914 and he was 21 years and four months. And he, he uh, was in the Palace Battalion, the 12th Yorks and Lancs. At his attestation, he was five foot four and a quarter, like your chap. It's important that quarter, isn't it? He weighed 108 pounds, which is only seven stone ten. It was a 32 inch chest, but on expansion, ma managed 34 and a half. So I think that's what got him in. I understand they had to have a 34 inch chest, so I suppose they made them all breathe out. He had a scar on his left elbow and the joint of his, one of his knees. And then I've got quite a bit on why the war started or how it started. Um, but he, he was in the 12th Battalion, which is the Palace Battalion. And um, this is them lined up outside Midland Station. A motley crew, aren't they? Now then, they all went to the Corn Exchange. And it took very little time for the battalion to reach its full point complement. Between 900 and 1,000 men were recruited in just two days. And uh, 
that came from all sorts of uh, backgrounds. There's also a narrative about the war. If anybody wants to read all this, because I'm only picking bits out, uh, I'm quite happy for you to do. But I just wanted to make these points about Frank. Um, he had his inoculations in January and another one in February. But on the 9th of January, he was posted to E Company. And by the 19th of June that year, he was appointed as an unpaid Lance Corporal. But he decided to revoke that on the 28th of June. So it was only a week or two. Uh, he probably, I don't know, he could surmise. He, he just wanted to be back with his mates. I have no idea. On the 1st of August, he was transferred to A Company. And this is a picture of the uh, Red Myers. When the men had been organised into companies and started the training, the next priority was to clothes and equipment. And for the first few months, the men had to make do with their own clothing. And this was not very resilient to the hardware of military life. They had to endure a lot of fun being poked at them as they charged imaginary German trenches in North Park in the Sunday best. <laughs> I just, I wonder if he's on there, but I'm not very good at picking faces out. They then went to uh, Penridge Bank Camp. And later to Lark Hill Camp on Salisbury Plain. That was 1915. He served for a, a, a year and 195 days. He was also killed at the Battle of Song. And his belongings were returned to the family. And this consisted of two reasons in the case of Spurs. He got the British War Medal, which is the first one. The other is the Victory Medal. Both sides left. And after the war, Sheffield actually placed a memorial in the village of Sare to the city, uh, city battalion, um, to the men who had fallen in that day, on that day, the 1st of July 1916. He's also remembered with honour at the Theme Hall Memorial in France. He's got a stained glass window upstairs. Because he wasn't meant to be here. And he's on the memorial at St. Tim's, and this is a close up of his name. <coughs> the top gravestone is the family grave in Crooks. <coughs> This, in 1919, the regiment wrote to his father, Willis, asking for all the details of the family, because he was to be awarded what they called a death penny, or a widow's penny. You can see that along with the right-hand side is a, a square box, which would have had his name engraved in there. I think that's probably all I said about Frank today. 